scripture lesson, which will be found in 2 Samuel, the sixth chapter. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000, and he and all of his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. And they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. And David and all Israel were celebrating with all of their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nikon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act, and therefore God struck him down. And he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry before the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now, King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Odom-Edom and, and everything he has because of the ark of God. And so David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps... He sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might. And while he and all of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets, as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. And after he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. And then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person. The whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women, and all the people went to their homes. And when David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. And David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house. When he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Well, this past week we focused a good bit on music with the retiring and the hiring of new music directors. So if you're sort of fond of classical music, then you probably know the name Rostropovich. Mitzlaf Rostropovich. He was a world-renowned cellist until his death in 07, and it seems that since his exile from Russia back in 1974, that he lived here in the U.S., where he served for 17 years as the music director of the National Symphony Orchestra in Washington, D.C. He was always something of a nonconformist. So in 1970, what does he do? Rostropovich, he shelters Nobel Prize winning Russian author Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who after being expelled from Russia for his rather dissonant political views had nowhere else to go. Or how about in the early 90s when the Kremlin hardliners, if you recall, launched a coup there in Russia. So Rostropovich at the time was in Paris. But instead of flying back 
to the U.S. and to safety. What does he do? Well, he flies straight to Moscow, a place that he had been exiled from. And there, once again, what does he do? He takes his place in the Russian Federation building, the same building that President Boris Yeltsin at the time and his elected officials were all holed up in the situation. It was rather tense. In fact, in the darkened corridors, someone even gave Rostropovich an automatic weapon. He returned it, though, and it said that instead he took out his cello and he gave an impromptu recital there to break the tension of the siege. Folks, have you ever known someone who surprised you by doing the opposite of what you expected? Someone who, who ran into the fire instead of away from it. From the outside looking in, you'd swear that they somehow had this backwards internal compass running south when instead they, they, they should have run north. But what they really had was sort of this uncommon courage, this moral inner trajectory that, that often seemed to lead them down the road less traveled. For instance, on this 4th of July weekend, when we pause and we reflect on the birth of our nation's freedom over 240 years ago, I don't think we can help but be awed by the courage, by, by the determination of our founding fathers and mothers and how they secured our independence. Over the last year, you know, I've been watching this historical TV series on the AMC channel. It's called Turn. It's about this period in history. And as a, as a viewer, you kind of get this inside peek of what the lives of those who were battling for freedom back then must have looked like. I mean, think of the risks that some of them must have taken because they believed in freedom, yeah, they, 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 they would have just played it safe, you know, if they just would have kept the status quo, if they, they just wouldn't have rocked the boat. Would you and I be here today worshiping as we are so freely if it were not for the, the bravery of these folks who risked everything and, and somehow ran towards danger? rather than away from it, so that we might enjoy the liberties that we celebrate this weekend. Well, last week in our own ongoing journey through the story, we met a guy named Saul. And Saul is a man's man. He's tall and he's handsome. He was a likely choice for a king. He was Israel's perfect choice for a king. But as we discovered he was not God's idea of a king. You see, Saul cut corners. And, and then sort of pathologically, he, he, he would rationalize this. Yeah, he was almost totally committed to God. And yet, he kept back a, a little corner of his life for himself so that he could control it. He withheld his allegiance to God, thinking it wouldn't matter. But it does, doesn't it? Yeah, almost never works with God. And here's why. Because God knows that you and I, we can never experience the fullest blessing that he has for us if we hold back even a little from him. You know, I have to confess that I'm not much of a gambler, but I do occasionally, when I'm flipping through the channels, like to settle on an ESPN poker tournament. I don't really have much of a clue as to, to what's going on, except that there's a lot of money at stake, and those guys have to be pretty good, you know, at being able to bluff their opponents. But there is one thing 
that I do get. And that's when one of those players, they, they, they go all in and they shove their entire pile of chips to the center of the table. I mean, I'm thinking with hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake that the guy must be crazy. Somehow his internal compass must be off. He's running towards danger and not away from it. Come on, buddy, play it safe. It's too much to risk. But I guess when it comes to the big stakes poker, it's went big or go home. And folks with poker, all in, that can be a big risk. You know, it's something that you decide is worth taking that risk. But with God, taking such a risk isn't really a risk after all. It's that transaction that God promises us that if we are willing in faith to take it, he will give us life itself. Yeah, love me with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. But unlike poker, where we can lose money, failure to go all in with God as we discovered last week, has some devastating consequences. Let's think about King Saul. He refused to go all in, and what did it cost him? It cost him his throne. So God, as the dealer, cuts him out of the deal, and instead he sets his sights on a boy who's just out there singing in the fields, taking care of his daddy's sheep. And folks, what is it that God looks for when he gazes into our hearts? You know what? I think he looks for someone who has his heart, who has his priority, someone who is willing to give their total allegiance to him. So this royal coronation begins, and it happens in the most improbable of places. It happens in the humble abode of the grandson of a guy that we met a few chapters ago in the story. You might recall his name, Boaz. Remember, he was the guy who married Ruth, the Moabitess, there in Bethlehem. And they had a boy, and his name was Obed, who became the father of who? Jesse. So God sends the prophet who we met last week, Samuel, to the home there in Bethlehem, of Jesse, and by this point of the story, maybe we should not be surprised anymore. I mean, God had already demonstrated this knack. He shows up in the unlikeliest of places. He he calls the most implausible of people to the most inconceivable of, of missions. Let's remember three chapters ago, who did he appear to? He appears to a guy named Gideon, who's hiding out down in this wine press, and Gideon says to God, hey, my my clan is, is the weakest in all the tribes of Manasseh, and I am the least from my entire family. And then last week, uh, once again, he, he appears to Saul, who even though he's tall and, and, and handsome, he too, where, where is he? He's hiding out in the supply shed, And when he is found and he's brought out to Samuel, he says, aren't I a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel and my clan the least of all of the clans? And so now, sure enough, Samuel is once more sent to this obscure little rural farming family to Jesse's house. And once again, this improbable search takes place. Jesse brings out his seven sons from oldest to the youngest, and Samuel goes down the line to each of them, bop, 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 bop. And yet, none of them give him the sense that he's the next king of Israel. So he's a bit flummoxed. He inquires of Jesse, hey, are these all the sons you got? And and, and Jesse admits that, yeah, there's... One other kid, he's out in the fields tending the sheep. He's the the runt of the litter. I didn't think about bringing him in, so they bring him in. And sure enough, 
Yeah, he's the one. David is anointed by Samuel now to replace Saul. And of course, the boy immediately does what any newly anointed king would do, right? He, he goes back to tending his sheep. Folks, I want you to mark this down because as we think about this, we're going to see a number of examples to come where we're going to get to see David do the exact opposite thing from what you would expect him to do. It seems that his compass is a bit off kilter. He mixes up his from and his towards. I mean, you'd think that a new king, what would he do? He would head straight to the tailors so that he could be fitted for his royal robes. His second call would be to the goldsmith so he could get his crown just precisely fitted. Yeah, a normal guy would have made one of those Disney commercials. You know the ones. David, you've just been anointed king of Israel. What are you going to do next? And David replies, what? I'm going to Disney World, right? But not this kid. Because there he is, quietly, back at his duties, fulfilling the role that God has given him. And that leads us to truth number one for today. Grow where you're planted. Focus on the mission that God has put in front of you right now. Yeah, it can be tempting to take our eyes off of the ball and to start dreaming of the next step. You know, planning your future and, and setting up your cabinets. But in so doing, you, you neglect the critical work that's staring you right in the face now. Folks, David was directionally challenged from the world's point of view right from the get-go. Because as we're going to see, he had a compass after God's own heart. And besides, hasn't God proven himself that he's a bit of an anti-establishment kind of a guy? Yeah, the world says he who dies with the most toys wins. But God says, give freely. Give me a tithe. Stop worrying about the numbers. Let me take care of the math. The world says, you know, Take hold of your destiny. But God says, he who loses his life will find it. Friends, example number one of David's from towards compass problem is that he headed not towards immediate glory and recognition, but towards his current assignments. Folks, that's our first lesson from today's story. Never take your eyes off the ball. Grow where you're planted. Focus first on your current assignment. You know, someone once said that the most radical thing that you could do is the very next thing of what God tells you to do. And it may not seem like it at first, but this is what radical obedience looks like in our lives. It's not doing what God says because you can clearly see the end, because you can see the end of the parade route out there somewhere. It's doing the next thing he tells you to do. And folks, in, in practical terms, that means go do your job. Be a good husband, guys, or a grandma, ladies, or a neighbor, or, or a worker, yeah, set your compass toward what God has put in front of you right now. That's what young David did. Sure, after his, his big anointing ceremony, things got a, got a bit quiet for a while. But eventually, this call came to him. Head towards the battlefield. 
Israelites were fighting the Philistines. So David was to take some supplies to his older brothers. And when he arrives, he sees what everyone else doesn't. Again, here's a boy with a mixed up compass. Because he sees an opportunity for God's power to be displayed. You see, the Philistines, they had what we might call a ringer. They had a secret weapon. Let's say you're in a recreational basketball league where everyone is about the same size and about the same ability except for one team. They go out and they recruit this former college basketball star who's six inches taller than anybody else on your team. This guy's a ringer. And the Philistines, they have one. You know him. He's in the form of a nine-foot-tall behemoth of a guy whose name is Goliath. So he stands out there, Goliath, taunting, intimidating Israel day after day. And yet for the second time, David's from towards indicator seems to be on the fritz. What does he do? He runs towards the giant. Literally, he shoves all of his chips to the center of the table and with no armor or shield or sword or spear, with just five smooth stones and a little slingshot, he faces Andre the giant on steroids. You know, there's a great missionary by the name of C.T. Studd. And he once said, you know, some people, they want to live within the sound of chapel bells. But I want to run a rescue shop a yard from the gate of hell. Yeah, David, just like C.T. Studd's compass must have been off kilter. It was on the fritz. It was broken. He didn't run, want to run from the battle. He wanted to run towards the battle. Which brings up our second truth for today. Never let fear be your compass heading. Folks, how was David able to accomplish this improbable thing of killing a giant with a little slingshot. Well, he had two things going for him, and they were faith and practice. Yeah, for years, God had been preparing this young man to face Goliath because we learned that on multiple occasions that David, as he was out tending his flock, he was attacked by wild animals, animals like bears, and lions, risking his own life. He fought off these wild beasts with nothing more than his staff and his sling. Folks, that's the kind of king that I think God was looking for. Because if David was willing to go to such lengths to take care of his animals, then just think how far he was willing to go to take care of God's flock, Israel. And that's why when, when Goliath stood out there threatening to, to squash him like a bug, that David was able to proclaim, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Talk about going all in. David doesn't mostly trust God. To him, it's a no-brainer. He knows that the battle belongs to the Lord. I mean, who in, their, who in their right mind would run towards a giant? Only a guy from the world's eyes whose compass is somehow off kilter. But let me ask you, how about your compass today? Are you running from or are you running towards the battle in your giving, 
in your living and in your serving. Like David, has God been preparing you for something greater? A bigger, Goliath-sized mission in your life. Is it time for you to take the plunge? And friends, after killing Goliath, David's days in the fields were over. Saul brings him into his court. He assigns him a high rank in his military operations. And David is well-liked. He's successful in all of his pursuits. The Lord is with him. And so eventually he marries Saul's daughter, Michael, and he becomes best buds with Saul's son, Jonathan. And yet because of his success, it would begin to plant this irreversible seed of jealousy in Saul. And all the people around, they were whispering, you know, Saul killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. So Saul eventually becomes more and more jealous, and, and to such an extent that he even tries to, to murder David several times. Let's take one occasion when David and his men, they're hiding out in the back of this cave, and who should walk in to take a nap but Saul. And so David's men, they, they sort of whisper to David, you know, this is his chance now to, to get his revenge. Go up and, 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 and take the dude out. So, so what does David do? Well, he, he, he creeps forward, but, but rather than kill Saul, he cuts off a piece of his robe. And even with just doing that, David feels guilty. And he says, Lord knows that I shouldn't have done that. He says to his men, it's a serious thing to attack the Lord's anointed. And yet a bit later, after Saul's left the cave and he's on the other side of, of, of the valley, David, he yells across the valley over to Saul. He makes it clear, hey, I had you dead to rights. Check your robe, and there, sure enough, there's a piece missing. David was a man after God's own heart. He was sensitive to, to God's will so much that he felt guilty for something as seemingly inconsequential as taking a piece of Saul's robe. And here's why, folks. Let's say that you work for a bad boss, like David did. David recognized that he needed to respect his boss, even though he was evil. That's what God says to us in the New Testament. David realized that you can never be a good leader unless you're first a good follower. He didn't want to teach those men who were following him to do the same. David had a good compass. And that leads us to our final compass bearing for today, the third from towards episode. David always seems to be running towards God. You know, as we read through the Psalms, we see how David has jotted down his faith and his fears. We get the passion of his relationship. He shares his innermost feelings. When he felt optionless, when he felt exasperated and unheard and, and confused, how about you, like David, is your first response to run away or to run toward God, to flee, or to worship. Let's take the example from our lesson for today in 2 Samuel. David, now as the king of Israel, he's conquered Jerusalem. He's made it his capital city. You remember that golden box that we've been talking about throughout the story, that one with the amazing, impossible power? Well, now it's time to bring the Ark of the Covenants, into David's royal city to provide for God a more permanent dwelling. 
And it's a seminal moment. It's a time for celebration. And David, being the kind of man he is, he recognizes this fact. This is not a time to, to give this sort of reserved golf clap, you know, kind of response to God. This is a time, folks, to go all in. And so as the ark is is brought into the city, no less than the king of all Israel, he's dancing with abandon before the ark of the Lord. And as he does so, he's doing it with little else than his whitey tidies on. And let's listen to what we, we read in the story. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from the window, and when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. So you know, David, he, he returns later home to his wife, and she says to him, My, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked as any vulgar fellow would. And David responds, he says, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father that I was celebrating. In fact, I will become even more undignified than this. I will become humiliated in my own eyes. Folks, how about your compass bearing these days? It's a good question. When we think about our lives Which direction is your compass pointed? When it came time for someone to stand up before a giant, David didn't say, you know, let somebody else do it. He stepped up. When it came time to be a man of integrity before his men, yeah, he he, he stepped up. And when it came time to worship the Lord with abandon, He didn't care what other people thought. Do you? He was a man after God's own heart. He was going to worship and serve the Lord with all of his might. So how about you today? Which direction is your compass pointing? Is it pointing toward God Or is it pointing away from him in your serving, in your giving, and in your living? Let's bow as we pray. Father God, set us free from a need to somehow worry about what other people think when it comes to our worship and serving of you. Let us go all in as we seek to make you number one in our lives. Let us be like David, a man after God's own heart.